So last Sunday, we heard the story of Jonah. And I said that a common moral for the story of Jonah is that you can't run away from God's call. But I also said that's not really true. People successfully run away from God's call all the time. Many of us here on this call are doing that right now. How? God is calling us to do or be something more or greater or just different. And we're resisting somehow. Maybe we're afraid. Maybe we're just ignorant or selfish. Like Jonah, we're all headed for Tarshish in our ships with no storm arising to stop us and no whale coming to take us back the other way. Now, let me be clear what I mean by God's call. God's call is not always something huge like quitting your job and going to be a missionary in a foreign country. It's not always about becoming a prophet who will shake the foundations of the oppressive orders of the world. It's not about selling everything to join a commune. At least it's not always about that. More likely for most of us, God is calling us to make changes like practicing a more disciplined prayer life or practicing more patience with our children or our parents. God may be calling us to more generously give of our money or our time or build better relationships within our community or make more phone calls or send more cards to hurting people, to live more in the moment, to reduce our carbon footprint through our diet or other lifestyle changes, to be more politically active at a local level, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are, these are all the ways that most of us are being called by God right now. And those are the calls that most of us are resisting in some way. Our reading today from Isaiah, like the story of Jonah, is the story of a person being called by God. But unlike Jonah, this person does respond to the calling. Isaiah does respond. Not only did he respond to God's call, but he volunteered without even being called by, by name. God did not call him by name specifically or even tell him what the mission was going to be. God just said, whom shall I send? And Isaiah responded with the words that we just heard or that the words that we just heard from Annie, here I am, Lord, send me. What we also get in this reading from Isaiah that we did not get in Jonah is the process that brought Isaiah to the place where he was ready and willing to answer God's call. It is that process or practice that gives all of us a pathway, a model to become more open and responsive to God's calling in our lives. The practice is meditating upon our tiny, humble place before the grandeur and wonder of God. Meditating upon our tiny, humble place before the grandeur and wonder of God. It is that experience or that vision of his tiny place before the grandeur of God that brings Isaiah to the point where he's ready to answer God's call. Isaiah begins with seeing God sitting on a throne, high and lofty. And in this vision, God is so grand, so great, it says that the hem of God's robe fills the temple in Jerusalem. This could also be translated the edge or the folds of God's skirt filled the temple, which cast the, the vision in a wonderfully feminine and maternal light, reminding us of the way a child can hide or seek comfort in the folds of a mother's skirt. But regardless of the exact interpretation, the point is that God is much greater than Isaiah had ever imagined or conceived. The temple, which is filled with the folds of God's skirt, is supposed to be the whole throne room of God. The temple is supposed to be where God is present and enthroned upon the Ark of the Covenant, which contains the stone tablets from the Ten Commandments. And the Ark has these golden seraphs on either side, these statues or golden seraphs that are extending their wings across the lid of the Ark. And that's supposed to be the throne of God where God sits enthroned. But Isaiah sees that this temple, which is the most magnificent structure in all of Israel, this temple is actually completely inadequate as a house for God. The throne Isaiah sees is not in the room at all. It is high and lofty, and the temple can't even contain the edge of God's skirt. Once Isaiah glimpses this grandeur, 
He then sees these magnificent and fantastic flying seraphs with six wings. Contrasting the lifeless golden seraphs uh, statues that are over the ark, these seraphs are alive and they have multiple wings and they use four to cover their eyes and feet, expressing reverence and humility for God and two wings to fly. And they sing the words that we will be singing in just a few moments, holy, 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 the whole earth is full of your glory. So the glory of God is not just in the temple, not just in Jerusalem, not just in Israel, but the earth, the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. At this point, Isaiah says, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Another way to translate I am lost is I am ruined. It could even have the sense of I have come completely undone. And I like that one best. I have become completely undone because it reminds me of a, a baseball being knocked out of its seams by a hard hit, like in the movie The Natural with Robert Redford, that old baseball movie, where he hits the ball so hard, it flies out of its seams and begins to unravel in the fielder's hands who's trying to figure out what's going on. That is Isaiah being hit so hard by this vision of God's grandeur that he comes undone and he begins to unravel. The seams that hold his outer personality together break apart, and even the inner world of his ego and all that he thought that he was unravels in the presence of God. When he says, I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips, that word unclean is important because it might not mean what we think it does. It doesn't mean sinful. It does not mean that he's a bad person or that because of his moral failings, he is unworthy. To be unclean is more about being out of alignment with God. If our car's wheels are badly out of alignment, it's going to be hard to steer the car in any particular direction. The car will keep veering off course in one way or another. By saying he is unclean, Isaiah is saying he is completely out of alignment with God, and he'll never be able to stay on course. His heart and mind and intentions will always be veering away from God in one way or another, and his people are also out of alignment with God, always veering away from God as a people. To address that concern, which no one in the passage disputes, they say, yeah, you're, you're unclean. The seraphs take a burning coal from the altar and press it against Isaiah's lips. Do not try this at home. Not a good place to interpret the Bible literally here. But I think of this as a way for Isaiah to be brought back to the moment, back to the present, back to his whole attention on this vision that he's experiencing. In some ways, seeing this vision and then worrying that he is unclean is one of the things that makes him unclean. It's a way that he turns his attention away from God to his own self. But even in the presence of God's majesty, then he's veering off course. It's a way that he flees from the awesome experience that he's having of God. Now, note also that he is completely unable to correct his uncleanliness by himself. He cannot make himself clean. He cannot help but veer away from God. So God takes the initiative, and God brings him back into alignment, back into the moment, back into the present, back into the presence of God. And then we hear the calling, whom shall I send and who will go for us? So now after this vision of God's grandeur, this coming undone, this unraveling of Isaiah's masks and egos that he puts on, this being brought back into alignment with God's presence, now he's able to respond to God's call. Even before he knows what he's being asked, he's able to say, here I am, send me. If we want to be closer to God, more responsive to God's calling, whether that is a call to come to some radical change in our life or a smaller shift in how we live. A good place to start is to meditate upon the grandeur of God. That might involve watching a storm out the window or watching a sunset while we walk around the neighborhood or feeling a gentle breeze on our skin. Meditating upon the grandeur of God may be feeling warm water from a faucet over our hands or it may be standing beside the ocean. It might involve reading a psalm that describes God's majesty, 
or meditating upon the wonder of our breath as we sing. It might involve sitting by a fire and watching the flames dance and those hot coals burn bright. It might involve staring deep into the eyes of someone we love or watching a baby sleep. It might involve looking at the night sky or watching a documentary on the cosmos, but any practice that brings together the wonder of creation and the wonderfully tiny place that we get to have in it. When we meditate on that reality, God will meet us there. In such meditations, God will do God's part. And that may involve bringing some metaphorical coal to our lips so that we can come back to the moment again and again and again, back to that glorious presence. Or maybe just it just involves being reminded as we're there that there is ample, soft, welcoming room in the folds of God's skirt. If we want to be more responsive to God, Isaiah offers us a way that does not involve fleeing through a raging sea or getting swallowed by a whale. Though it might involve appreciating the power of a raging sea and the wonders of the animals who live there. Because when we meditate regularly on the majesty and grandeur of God and our tiny vital place in God's creation, we'll be much more likely to hear the call, whatever that may be, and to answer with Isaiah, here I am, send me. Amen.